The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Good afternoon and welcome. Um, my name is Meredith Clayson. I am the Associate Director of our Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies here at the University of Chicago. Before I introduce our guest, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the Center for International Studies, especially Jamie Bender, the Assistant Director for Programming, for putting this lecture into their World Beyond the Headlines series. Thanks also to the Center's Norman Waite Harris Fund and the Frankie Institute for the Humanities, both of which are co-sponsors of our Connecting with the Caucasus speaker series, organized by our center. Um, we're kicking off the speaker series today with uh, Dr. Marco Donut's talk. And on that note, allow me to introduce our distinguished guest. Sergei Markadonov did his undergraduate work at Rostov on Don State University and holds a doctoral degree in history from Rostov on Don State Pedagogical University. He has held teaching positions at Rostov on Don State Pedagogical University, the Russian State University for the Humanities, Moscow State University, and the Diplomatic Academy. From 1998 to 2001, he served as senior fellow at the Governor's Press Service in the Rostov Regional Administration. And from 2001 to 2010, he worked as head of the Inter-Ethnic Relations Group and Deputy Director at the Institute for Political and Military Analysis in Moscow. Since May 2010, Sergei Markadonov has been a visiting fellow in the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Russia and Eurasia program in Washington, D.C. He is an expert on regional security, nationalism, and inter-ethnic conflicts in the Caucasus, the Black Sea, and the de facto states in the post-Soviet space. His publications are too numerous to list, but include several books, chapters and reports, about 100 academic articles, and more than 500 press pieces. I should mention that several of Dr. Markadonov's reports are available on the Center for International Studies website, um, and I invite you to, to find them there and, and read them. But today we will hear Sergei Markadonov speak on the Caucasus region at the geopolitical and security crossroads. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much for this brilliant presentation. Now I uh, want to proud off, to be puffed off, <laughs> but it's time to make presentation for you. Uh, first of all, uh, let me express my gratitude for having me here as a presentator. As far as I understand, uh, today I will open the series connecting with the Caucasus. It's a great honor for me because uh, the second uh, presentator uh, is a well-known specialist in Russia, and it's uh, especially pleasant for me uh, to get acquainted on him personally. I mean here, Dr. Khodorkovsky, because I read many of his writings and found them very, very useful for my activity. But now it's time to uh, <clears throat> turn to my presentation itself. Today we would speak about uh, the Big Caucasus. I understand this term as uh, identification for three newly independent state, states of the South Caucasus, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. Uh, three de facto state, uh, states of the same region, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, as well as uh, seven constituencies of the Russian North Caucasus. I uh, speak about Big Caucasus because many problems existing in the North Caucasus are directly influencing on the dynamics of South Caucasus. It's impossible to study uh, some group of problems uh, with no connection with uh, other side of this region. Uh, after the USSR collapse, or dissolution, it's better to say, in 1991, uh, the Big Caucasus has become one of the most problematic, at least, or most unstable and predictable region of uh, the post-Soviet space or Eurasia. Six of eight conflicts uh, have taken place in this region. Nagorno-Karabakh conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, Georgian Ossetian, Georgian Abkhaz conflicts, uh, two conflicts uh, on the territory of Russia, Ossetian and Gush conflict, and <coughs> a Russian Chechen conflict, and one civil war in Georgia in 1991-1993. It uh, <coughs> took place with some uh, breaks. Three or four de facto states existing in the post-Soviet space are in the Big Caucasus. Only Transnistria, located in uh, the Nistar River, 
uh, is uh, outside of the Caucasus. And please add uh, Chechen Republic, which existed totally for six years in 1991-1994 and 1996-1999. Now it doesn't exist as a de facto state, but <clears throat> the uh, problem of Chechnya is not completely resolved uh, nowadays. Uh, the first precedent uh, of uh, reconsideration of the uh, interstate borders created in the Soviet time also took place in the Caucasus. I mean here events of 2008. Those events uh, are identified as Russian-Georgian War or the August War or Five Days War of 2008. But anyway, <coughs> uh, first time since the USSR dissolution in 1991, Russia or some other countries recognized the uh, national sovereignty of former autonomous regions, not Union Republics. It was the first uh, precedent after the USSR uh, dissolution. Uh, this area uh, <clears throat> is a priority area for uh, some uh, Eurasian stakeholders like Iran, Turkey and Russia. And uh, it also has a great implication on the processes in neighboring regions like Middle East and Black Sea region. And uh, don't forget about uh, 2014 event, uh, which is so important personally for Vladimir Putin and for current Russian leadership. I mean here the Winter Olympics of 2014 in Chechnya. Uh, formerly, uh, Sochi now is not a part of North uh, Caucasus Federal District, but historically, politically, it's a part of the Caucasus dynamics. Dynamics between Russia and Georgia, Circassian question, uh, de facto border between Russia and Abkhazia, and, and so on. Uh, now I'm not going to do history uh, in this uh, auditorium, only uh, some uh, phrases. Uh, because uh, after the USSR uh, dissolution in 1991, the Caucasus has become a very important region for the international agenda. It has made maybe a return to the major league of international policy. Uh, it uh, has made many steps from the periphery region, peripheral region, to the uh, very important uh, region for the international agenda. <clears throat> uh, historically, uh, the Caucasus uh, frequently was in the focus of uh, geopolitical competition. Uh, between uh, 16th and 18th century, Persian and the Ottoman Empire competed each other for this region, and uh, since the uh, last quarter of the 18th century, the Russian Empire joined this concert. And in the uh, first, the, the, this game, as you like, and in the first quarter of the 19th century, Russia secured its uh, geopolitical domination, uh, uniting uh, different areas, different entities existing in the Caucasus under one auspices, one power. Uh, this order existed till uh, 1917, till the, till the collapse of the Russian Empire, when uh, the Caucasus uh, returned uh, uh, again to the major league of the international policy. It was competitive area between reds, whites, different parts of Russia, newly independent states formed after the uh, Russian imperial, imperial, Empire collapse, uh, between uh, Germany, Turkey, and uh, entente uh, countries. But in 1920-1921, uh, uh, the territory of the big Caucasus, including uh, Transcaucasia or South Caucasus and North Caucasus, uh, was united by the Soviets. It was Sovietized, and uh, since uh, 1921, uh, one power, one order was put in this area. And it was outside of uh, interest of the international witnesses and observers. Maybe some problems uh, uh, were observed, but in the uh, wider context, like human rights violation, political order in the USSR. For example, in the 70s, some American senators initiated to award uh, Zviad Gamsahurdia and Mirab Kastava by a Nobel Prize of Peace, let could not imagine consequences of coming to power of Zviad Gamsakhurdia. 
with his slogan, Georgia for Georgians, and so on. But there was time of illusions, belief that all people who fought against communists are Democrats and very good Democrats and, and so on. But anyway, the uh, region was outside of the international agenda. In uh, 1991, situation changed uh, rapidly because newly independent states <clears throat> were proclaimed. On the contrary, uh, some former autonomous regions proclaimed de facto statehood, being disagreed with the uh, proclamation of uh, national independence and uh, uh, some international actors uh, uh, demonstrated their interest to uh, this region, economic, geopolitical, multidimensional at last. <laughs> Let me start my observation uh, of this region with Russia. Uh, it's not due to my Russian background or neo-imperialist aspirations or so on. Russia, as well as Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia is also the Caucasus country. You could say Russia is also a Far East country, European country, uh, you would be right, of course. But uh, anyway, Russian uh, territory of the Caucasus, territory of the Russian Caucasus is uh, larger than uh, all territories of newly independent and de facto states. Population of uh, one uh, Russian constituency, Dagestan, is comparable with the uh, population, uh, the whole population of Armenia. It's about three million people. It's comparable, plus minus, because all uh, censuses are not so strict in the post-Soviet space. It's necessary to criticize methods and techniques of censuses, but it's another uh, huge question. Uh, but uh, many problems uh, existing in the South Caucasus uh, have uh, the great impact on the dynamics in the Russian North Caucasus. And uh, this situation differs uh, the uh, South Caucasus from other parts of the post-Soviet space, like Kazakhstan, like Central Asia, uh, or uh, Baltic countries. This is why Russian policy in the... Uh, above mentioned directions uh, is not so persistent like uh, in the Caucasus. Uh, for example, uh, the Georgian Ossetian conflict uh, influences on the uh, Ossetian and Gush conflict uh, in Russia. It was the first ethno political conflict uh, taking place in the Russian territory because uh, due to the policy of uh, Georgia, uh, this uh, country was uh, left by uh, 40,000 assets, not only from South Ossetia, but from uh, internal regions of Georgia. And uh, in the early 90s, uh, this population composed 15% of the population of the Russia's North Ossetia constituency inside Russia. And uh, those people uh, were engaged in the conflict with Ingush, another ethnic group in the Russian Caucasus. Situation around the Georgian Abkhaz conflict uh, is uh, directly connected with the uh, situation in Circassian constituencies of Russia because you know that Abkhaz people are relatives of Adige people or Circassians and uh, it uh, helps us to explain uh, the huge number of uh, Circassians volunteering in the Georgian Abkhaz conflict. About 7,000 Circassians joined the Abkhaz forces and they played a very uh, important role in the uh, military clash dynamics. Moreover, many Circassians uh, moved to Abkhazia after uh, the Georgian Abkhaz war, and some of them played significant role creating de facto authorities, like Sultan Sasnaliev, who was vice prime minister and minister of defense, now he is dead. But previously, he played significant role in the creation of Abkhaz uh, de facto uh, armed forces. Uh, Circassian question, I mentioned it. Uh, after the uh, 2008 events, Georgia tried to uh, invent some uh, answer on the Russian recognition of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And they found uh, them, uh, I mean, here, Circassian question. Previous year, previous May, Georgian parliament recognized uh, the so-called genocide of Circassians. 
And uh, it was aimed to create obstacles for Olympic Games because uh, those Circassians were expelled from the territories of uh, current Sochi and uh, uh, Adler district of this territory. And uh, it was also a kind of uh, uh, obstacle in the relationship between Abkhaz people and uh, Circassian nationalist or nationalistic movements. Uh, the uh, problem of uh, Chechnya is connected with uh, security in Pankisi Gorge in Georgia and the security of Dagestan in Chechnya is also uh, relating to the situation in Georgia. Maybe you heard something about recent dynamics in Lapota Gorge in Georgia. It's, Russian, uh, it, it's Dagestani part of the Russian-Georgian border. Uh, which was uh, the target for attack of uh, the Caucasus Emirate structures, radical Islamist structure uh, existing in the North Caucasus. This is why Russia is uh, actively engaged in the old processes in the Caucasus. In the early 90s, uh, Russia's rule was practically uh, unchallengeable in this region. Now it uh, sounds like paradox, but United States and European Union were rather passive. That time, and they de facto recognized the leading role of Russia in the Biskimen activity in South Ossetia, Abkhazia, Nagorno-Karabakh, and United States uh, Department of State even agreed on the military presence of Russia outside of Abkhazia and South Ossetia on the nuclear territory of Georgia. And here agreement between Yeltsin and Shevardnadze on deployment of four uh, military bases on the Georgian territory. Uh, but then situation uh, began changing. Uh, speaking about European Union and the U.S. engagement in the region, I would touch uh, the reasons uh, in a more detailed way. Uh, but uh, the uh, other reasons uh, outside of U.S. penetration or European Union penetration in the regions uh, were claims of the uh, newly independent states. Yesterday they were Union Republics of the USSR. They had no their own interests. But now they are predetermined by the national egoism. It's not bad, it's not good. Even Armenia, which is considered as a persistent ally of Russia, uh, has its own programs with NATO, uh, own interest to the United States. By the way, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, non-recognized entity, is the only one which received, receives uh, since 1998 fiscal year direct financial support from the United States. It's impossible to imagine such things in the case of Abkhazia or South Ossetia. This financial support is not huge, between 10, 12 million dollars, but the amount is not a crucial question. The fact of attention and fact of financial support and um, balancing between interests of Azerbaijan and Armenia. This is why uh, newly independent states were interested to have counterweight, counterbalance to the Russian dominance through some fears, geopolitical complexes and so on. We could criticize them and so on, but it's, it's a reality. Uh, and uh, the second point is behavior of Russia itself. Yes, uh, Russia was so effective in the freezing of the conflicts, but not in the searching of the resolution. I'm not sure, by the way, that America would be so effective in the resolution, but anyway. Uh, and uh, other problem is a concentration of the Russian behavior only on relationship with the official authorities. And no any other uh, projects oriented on modernization and the development. It's kind of very, very conservative or uh, maybe preservation of the situation project, not, not development. This is why it uh, provoked uh, competitive uh, activity in this uh, area since the uh, end of 90s, early 2000s. A uh, very important question which is uh, uh, frequently raised, especially in the uh, American audiences, uh, concerns the Russian revisionism, geopolitical revisionism of 2008. Before the August 
of 2008, Russia uh, followed uh, the policy of status quo keeping. Status quo is better than any other uh, developments. But in 2008, uh, Russia uh, made a very different step, recognizing uh, the independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia and creating the precedent. It's, it's impossible to explain why the situation in South Ossetia and Abkhazia is uh, so different in principle. It would look like any American explanation on the Kosovo case. Kosovo case is a unique case. Okay, all cases are unique. Kosovo is, is a unique case, but Abkhazia is also unique, as well as Nagorno-Karabakh is not the same as Abkhazia or Transnistria. But anyway, it's kind of precedent, political, first of all, not judicial, but political. Uh, but uh, after it, Russia uh, didn't uh, continue this uh, line. For example, uh, in the case of Nagorno-Karabakh, Russian behavior is very, very different. Yes, Russia uh, rejects recognition of Nagorno-Karabakh and even uh, blames de facto authorities for providing of uh, different electoral campaigns, insisting on the territorial integrity of uh, Azerbaijan because Russia shares with Azerbaijan the Dagestani part of the interstate border. It's crucially important for both countries. And in this situation, as well as in the case of Crimean Peninsula or Transnistria, Russian behavior is very, very different. This is why we could speak about selective revisionism concerning only Abkhazia and South Ossetia, not the whole Caucasus or the whole post-Soviet space. Uh, now it's a very hard time for me. I'm going to uh, speak about the U.S. interests in the Caucasus, in the American audience. Um, but please uh, treat this uh, uh, attempt like one of a uh, scholar. It's not official position of the Kremlin or some other <laughs> governmental structures. Uh, I, uh, I think... Uh, in Russia, there is a real lack of uh, comprehension and understanding of the American interests in this region. Uh, first of all, uh, having a rich experience as a teacher, I touched uh, absence of knowledge of empirical data. For example, many uh, students, not only students, even professors and some distinguished experts don't know that the United States of America recognized Georgia uh, in the Caucasus last, only in April 1992, after recognition of uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Now it looks paradoxical, but it was, because you know that the first uh, elected president of Georgia, Zviad Gamsakhurdia, was uh, uh, overthrown. Uh, due to military cup in uh, December 1991, uh, January 1992. It was a problem of legitimacy, and only personality of Shevardnadze promoted the recognition of Georgia. Without Shevardnadze, I'm not sure, by the way. But now, nowadays, Georgia is uh, the most persistent ally of the United States, uh, securing the most numerous military uh, contingent uh, in Afghanistan among non-NATO um, countries. Now it's, a, it's a, a, about 925, but the Georgian government promised to increase it uh, to uh, 1,005 people. Uh, position of uh, United States for the first half of 90s was rather passive. The situation began changing after so-called Azerbaijan century contract of 1994. You know that uh, uh, in 1994 Azerbaijan signed a contract with the consortium of uh, oil, uh, Western oil companies, including uh, such American uh, ones like Amoco and, and some others which access to the mineral resources of Azerbaijan, it provoked interest to the political situation in the region because Azerbaijan was engaged in the conflict with Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, the attitude of the U.S. before 1994 was uh, determined and dictated in many aspects by Armenian lobby. Uh, but after 1994, uh, attitude was uh, more balanced, more nuanced, 
And uh, then uh, in 1997, the United States supported uh, Guam, integration structure which identified itself like not anti-CIS but alter CIS organization. And uh, then I mentioned uh, claims of the independent uh, countries of the region to see United States like counterweight to Russia. Uh, Russian interest to the region uh, increased dramatically after 9-11 of uh, 2001 and especially after the start of Afghanistan and Iraq operation. Because from the point of logistics, security, the Caucasus uh, region is very important. You know that now many of uh, cargoes of NATO are transported through Azerbaijan. I mentioned about the Georgian uh, engagement in the operation of Afghanistan. Previously, Georgia was engaged in Iraqi operation and Kosovo peacekeeping activity. It also secured contingent. But anyway, the interest of the United States is rather different from the interest of Russia, because for Russian uh, Federation, the South Caucasus is a continuation of the domestic political agenda. It's kind of North Caucasus too. But for uh, United States, the situation is uh, very different. The Caucasus uh, and uh, different countries are considered through the prism of wider problems. Georgia, for example, is considered, first of all, through the prism of uh, Russian-American uh, relations and Russian policy in Eurasia. I personally criticized American officials for fears and phobias concerning uh, restoration of the Soviet Union. Soviet Union was uh, ideological uh, identity. With, uh, without communism, it's impossible to restore it without uh, ideology, without uh, technique and methods uh, experienced in the USSR and, and, and so on. But anyway, these uh, phobias are very strong in Washington, D.C., and uh, they uh, determine in many aspects the policy. This is why recognition of Abkhazia and South Ossetia are considered in Washington, D.C. by many people, not like uh, self-determination of Abkhaz people and Ossets, but like Russian technique for increasing of uh, political military security presence in Eurasia. Because uh, America experienced Cold War period and many uh, fears and phobias are psychologically understandable. Uh, fears of restoration of USSR and, and so on. As for Armenia and Azerbaijan, they are also uh, considered in the prism of a uh, wider agenda, Iran, Turkish, Turkish-American relations and the uh, question of Armenian genocide and Armenian agenda is considered like a factor of pressure of, on Turkey. As for Azerbaijan, America is interested to have uh, the ally among Muslim countries, especially after Arab Spring, because now U.S. rating in the Muslim world is close to zero, maybe less than zero. In this way, Azerbaijan is more than welcomed. And let's see a difference in the rhetoric addressed to Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. Georgia uh, looks like student before the teacher. Please, guys, pass exams on democracy, transparency, and so on. In the case of Azerbaijan, no. Predictability only and stability. Be stable, be predictable. As for human rights, Maybe it's peculiarities of uh, the local culture and, 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 and so on. A very diversified approach to the, to, to, to the countries. And uh, even for the uh, visit of the State Secretary, uh, Mrs. Clinton raised questions of human rights or democratic procedures in Georgia and Armenia, not in Azerbaijan. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, Afghanistan, also, I mentioned this uh, issue and uh, the Caucasus role, uh, logistics, transportation, and uh, engagement of uh, military contingent. It's, it's so serious. I understand that from the military point of view, Georgian army is not the best in the contemporary world. Oh, okay, but France, Germany, or European Union countries are not ready to deploy uh, their troops because of democratic procedures, by the way. In the case of Georgia, it's easier. 
uh, to make uh, and uh, recently a uh, special representative of the uh, NATO General Secretary James Apaturai met on Bedzina Ivanishvili and Bedzina Ivanishvili demonstrated his readiness to follow the uh, previous course and no uh, specific competition between him and Saakashvili, by the way. Uh, you know that uh, advertising a paper on my uh, lecture is uh, uh, supported by the photo between uh, Barack Obama and Mikhail Saakashvili. It was a symbolic photo, by the way, because it demonstrated n new nuances in the American approach to Georgia. Uh, under uh, Bush uh, Jr., uh, America identified Georgia with Saakashvili and support of Saakashvili meant support of Georgia. In the period of Obama presidency, uh, some nuances uh, were changed. Nowadays, Georgia is a light, not Saakashvili. Saakashvili is a candle, but not light itself. And the name, uh, no matter who would uh, deploy uh, Georgian troops in Afghanistan, Ivanishvili, Saakashvili, Usupashvili, or some other guys. It, uh, the policy to Georgia became, under Obama, more depersonalized, more institutional. Of course, we need to have predictable ally. There are no oil and some other mineral resources in Georgia in comparison with Azerbaijan. Okay, guys, please follow democratic procedures and, and so on. European Union. Uh, in uh, most of issues, European Union uh, does its policy together with the U.S. and NATO. But, uh, and the uh, approach of European Union look, look like similar to American. And the story of penetration, of engagement of this integration structure uh, looked like American. In the period of 90s, European Union was engaged in the resolution of the problem of power keg of Europe, Balkans, first of all. It was the first question. It's interesting that uh, among 15 countries of uh, European community and then of European Union, only some of them opened uh, all uh, separate embassies in all countries of the Caucasus, in Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. They were the Netherlands, uh, United Kingdom, Germany, France. All other countries and European delegation opened their embassies or representations only in Tbilisi. By the way, uh, following the uh, old Russian imperial tradition to deploy all Caucasus uh, structures in Tbilisi, by the way. And uh, uh, only through some waves of enlargement of European Union, this structure increased its interest to the Caucasus, because after the joining, uh, after Bulgaria and Romania joined the European Union, uh, this structure became regional actor in the Black Sea area. Uh, but uh, speaking about uh, many similarities in the U.S., NATO, European Union approach, it's necessary to uh, specially mark differences between them. It would be oversimplification to totally identify the interests of European Union and United States. European Union is concentrated more on uh, political humanitarian aspects, not on the hard power. This approach has its minuses and pluses. From the first of responsibility, maybe it's minuses, because European Union could propose only brilliant words about peace, about translation of positive experience, like German, France, uh, French relationship after 1945, and so on. But it's not supported by, by the force, real force, real resources. And this is why European Union position is vulnerable and dependent on the position of United States and NATO. But on another side, um, it could uh, exclude some uh, oversimplifications and mistakes made by the U.S., especially in the case of Georgia. And because the United States, uh, since 1993-1994, Eight formed uh, very, very high expectations among Georgians. And they missed dozens of common points existing in the relationship between U.S. and Russia. 
like Iran, Afghanistan, Korean problems, and some other uh, points. Uh, European Union is more active in Georgia. After 2008 events, uh, the European Union monitoring mission in the conflict zone is, in, is uh, the only international structure observing in uh, the region. Yes, they have no access to South Ossetia and Abkhazia due to the Russian position, but anyway, it's the only international structure uh, existing uh, now. As for Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, European Union keeps a very, very low profile in the resolution. Its engagement is restricted only by France co-chairmanship in the OECC Minsk Group. Uh, seeing uh, the title of this slide, you understand that now we could speak about Iran and Iranian policy. Now uh, we could speak about 2012 as the Iranian year, because now it's in the focus of mass media, possible attacks of Iran on Israel, Israel on Iran, American engagement, nuclear problem, and so on. But uh, though Iran uh, pretends to play international role, really it's uh, first and foremost regional country. And the top priorities of Iran uh, are Middle East, Central Asia and the Caucasus, neighboring regions. And the policy of, of Iran in the Caucasus demonstrates an uh, interesting mixture of uh, ideological purism and very, very, maybe highly pragmatic approach. Uh, on the one side, yes, uh, Iran, first and foremost, is uh, uh, afraid of international intervention to the region. This is why it's the only country which uh, speaks about uh, its own alternative to the updated Minsk principle of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict resolution. Nobody uh, have seen those alternatives, but anyway, Iran from time to time repeats that current format proposing deploying of international peacekeepers wouldn't work for Iran. No international peacekeepers. American, Swedish, Finnish, uh, Indonesian, no, no matter. Uh, the second point is uh, international uh, engagement, uh, uh, sorry, not, not international, I spoke some seconds ago about international engagement, Israeli engagement in the Caspian Sea. It's a specific topic, and in this way cooperation between Israel and Azerbaijan provokes hostility between two countries. Anyway, the uh, relationship between Azerbaijan and Iran uh, gave a huge ground for uh, alarmism, but anyway, Iran didn't uh, overcome red lines in relationship with neighboring country. Previous week, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad uh, visited Baku and said about uh, friendship, fraternal relations between neighbors and uh, some hegemonist forces who are obstacles for developing and deepening of huge friendship between two countries. Uh, Iran is interested to keep status quo in the region. It's, it's, it's a paradox because Iran is well known due to its criticism to the Western countries' policies and engagement of US, European Union, especially the United Kingdom and Israel. But at the same time, Iran is not ready to recognize independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And it was a special statement made by Ministry and Ambassador of Iran to Russia concerning this topic, and because Iran is afraid of any precedents. You know about the Azerbaijani minority, very numerous minority in this country. This is why in uh, its attitude to Abkhazian and South Ossetian independence, Iran behaves like European Union countries or United States. And in its policy uh, in the Caucasus, Iran uh, is based, first of all, on the national egoism. Because you know that Azerbaijan, as well as Iran, is a Muslim country with Shia majority. But at the same time, uh, there are many contradictions between uh, two uh, fraternal countries. 
On another side, Iran supports Christian Armenia, especially through the energy systems, gas, railway uh, connections, and, and so on. And uh, Georgia also. In 2010, November, two countries abolished visa regime. And Iran uh, is interested to see Georgia like a window to the West, and uh, maybe as a place of keeping of its interest in the uh, region as whole. Well. The next uh, country is Turkey. Turkey, as well as Iran, are not freshmen in the Caucasus geopolitics in comparison with the European Union and United States. Uh, Turkey uh, became in the focus of the Caucasus studies in 2008 August when uh, the Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan initiated the Caucasus Platform Project, kind of the Caucasus OECC, and uh, tried to play a role of mediator between Russia and Georgia, and practically uh, at the same time uh, the Turkish President uh, Abdullah Gül uh, firstly visited Yerevan. It was the start of so-called football or soccer diplomacy. This promising start wasn't finished. It is not finished nowadays. Uh, the protocols were signed by uh, the Armenians and uh, the Turks, but they were not ratified in the national parliaments, and nowadays the negotiations process is uh, frozen because two sides made huge miscalculations. Armenia believed in the divorce between Azerbaijan and Turkey. Uh, Turkey hoped on the same in the relationship between diaspora and Armenia itself, uh, on the more, uh, as well as on the more Russian pressure on Armenia. But dis been disappointed, two countries stopped uh, the process of normalization. But at the same time, we have a request on normalization existing beyond the official uh, formats. Now we are witnesses of uh, normalization between uh, scholars, and we are witnesses of discussion of the historical questions and legacy of the past between not Armenians and Armenians, but between Turks and Armenians. Even some writings of Taner Akcham, Turkish uh, originated scholar who lives now in the United States and who recognizes the genocide of Armenians in 1915, are published in Turkey. Five, seven years ago, it was impossible to imagine. I'm not so optimist, I'm rather realist, but anyway, it's a huge uh, step of Turkey. Uh, as well as in 1918-1920, uh, uh, Azerbaijan has become the strategic partner of Turkey uh, in the region. Uh, as for Georgia, it's a very uh, paradoxical approach because on the one side, Turkey uh, supporting the idea zero uh, problems with neighbors, but now it's not true, many problems, but anyway, it's theoretical background. And Turkey recognizes territorial integrity of Georgia. It cooperates through investment uh, programs and military security programs with this country. But on another side, Turkey uh, keeps the Abkhaz uh, window open. In, 19, in 2009, the uh, undersecretary of the Turkish foreign ministry, Unal Chivikos, he is Circassian descent, by the way, visited Suhumi and provoked rumors on possible recognition of Abkhazia from the uh, Turkish side. But anyway, I, I'm not sure that this recognition would be possible due to Armenian or Kurdish problems, uh, fears of precedent. But anyway, uh, Turkey uh, has not created any obstacles for cooperation of businessmen of Abkhaz origination with a historical uh, homeland uh, business contacts uh, like uh, coal mining, like uh, export of uh, wood and, uh, and, and so on. This is why it's kind of paradoxical attitude to the uh, Abkhaz 
uh, problem. As for uh, Russian-Turkish relations, uh, they are not limited only by the Caucasus format, but it's necessary to uh, register a huge breakthrough in the relationships. It uh, has started uh, since the mid of 90s, when Russia stopped any uh, support of the Kurdish uh, Labour Party and uh, Turks support, stopped supports any uh, activity uh, relating to the Chechen separatism. Only a couple of words about international uh, formats, uh, because it's, it's impossible to speak everything of the Caucasus for uh, my time. This is why I uh, ask you to, to ask questions. Uh, I'm ready to answer. As for the international formats, I mentioned that nowadays only European Union monitoring mission is present in the region. As for UN mission, OSCE mission, uh, they stopped uh, their activity after events of uh, 2008. Uh, it's uh, due to position of Russia, but don't oversimplify this position. Don't forget that, uh, of, of course, Russia is not interested to have any uh, observers, witnesses uh, in their conflict zones. But at the same time, uh, formats of OCC and UN presence were created in very definite historical conditions of the early 90s where Russian role was estimated positively by Americans, Europeans, international structures, and uh, those formats dealt with the realities of the 90s. They uh, were based on status quo existed those times. For example, the mandate of OECC recommends strictly to cooperate with the Joint Control Commission. Where is Joint Control Commission? It's based on, based on Dagamis agreement on ceasefire of 1992. But Georgia left this agreement in 2008. The same uh, relates to Moscow agreement of 1994 on Abkhazia, which was a uh, basement for the UN mission start. And uh, nowadays, uh, the international presence uh, decreases not only uh, evil will of Russia, by the way, Russia, paradoxically, is also interested to have international uh, presence in order to uh, promote uh, new realities comprehension. It's a uh, kind of benefit for the Russian interest in the region. Now let me stop my uh, presentation. I understand I touched only some aspects of very controversial and complicated problem. Only one conflict would take couple of monographs, or maybe dozens of monographs, like Nagorno-Karabakh or georgia Abkhaz conflict, or the role of Russia for uh, all of conflicts and uh, separately in uh, different uh, situations. Now I am ready to answer your questions. Please raise your hands and I am ready. Okay. Uh, summarizing, I received uh, three questions. Uh, Rose Revolution and its role for uh, the development of the region, Armenian prospects for recognition of Nagorno-Karabakh, and uh, uh, reshaping of new status quo uh, for the whole region. Uh, of course, you, you are right, uh, noting that I missed the issue of Rose Revolution of 2003. But I try to concentrate on geopolitical dimension on the region, not on domestic issue. I am not overestimating the role of the United States in the Rose Revolution. It's usual thing in Russia to say this revolution was created by Washingtonsky Abkom party uh, and, and, and so on. But sorry, if we would speak about Washingtonsky Abkom party, we uh, would have to recognize the huge popularity of Eduard Shevardnadze and huge stupidity of Georgian people on the streets in 2003. I am not sure in both things. Shevardnadze lost its popularity absolutely. Uh, he was discredited through the huge corruption, uh, through the failures in uh, resolution of the conflicts in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. In 2004, uh, I met first time uh, on Nino Burjanadze. That time, uh, she was the chairman of the Georgian parliament. And I asked her about uh, the uh, first year 
of the revolution, after, after revolution consequences, basic results. And uh, her answer was very curious for me personally. He especially mentioned the uh, better conditions for the Georgian soldiers. Our soldiers uh, have good food, she said, and uh, good shoes. She didn't mention uh, any uh, kind of human rights or democracy and so on. Soldiers, security, and so on. Georgia under Shevardnadze, especially uh, after the last year of Shevardnadze, was uh, perceived by many inside and outside of Georgia as a failing or failed state. And in 2003, uh, Georgia requested not a democracy, but the statehood. Strong man strong hand, and this is why it helps us to explain why uh, Saakashvili looks like Putin in many, many of his steps. Rhetoric, behavior, uh, pop extreme populism, and so on. Because it was a request of the society. We suffered from the lack of the statehood, a lack of uh, predictability, please, give us. Of course, the uh, Rose Revolution uh, promoted hostility between Russia and Georgia, but this hostility uh, was not discovered by Saakashvili. It goes back to the earlier period. Rose Revolution promoted greatly this hostility. Because I think uh, Mikhail Saakashvili became hostage of his first success and promising start in Adjaria. He perceived it like the first step of uh, assembling of Georgia, but he missed principal differences between Adjaria on the one side and South Ossetia and Abkhazia on, on the other one, because Adjarian case was not ethno-political. It was a case of privatization of power in the separate area. It uh, didn't relate to the nationalism discourse as well as in the cases of Abkhazia and uh, South Ossetia. And starting his uh, unfreezing of the conflict in South Ossetia, Saakashvili uh, miscalculated uh, interests of Russia and connections between Russian domestic agenda and uh, crisis in South Ossetia. Let's imagine for a couple of minutes that Saakashvili uh, won in 2004 or in 2008. Russia would receive in this situation a couple of dozens of thousands of refugees, 20 or even 10,000 refugees. And the North Ossetian and Gush conflict is not resolved. In this way, we would have additional problems, issues, challenges in the North Caucasus. Saakashvili so absolutely ignored Russian uh, interest uh, in uh, the situation. Speaking about so-called Russian interests and, and uh, occupation and, and so, so, so on, so on, so on. And he really believed in uh, the uh, total support of the United States and its readiness to defend the Georgian sovereignty. In April 2008, I traveled to Georgia and met Timur Yakabashvili. Timur Yakabashvili now is uh, the Georgian ambassador to the United States in Washington, D.C. That time he was recently appointed minister. Previously he was political analyst as well as me. And we talked about uh, South Ossetia. It was in April 2008, some months before the hot August. And he uh, told me, uh, Sergei, don't worry, it would be kind of Serbian Krajina of 1995. My answer was the following, Timuri, feel the difference between Serbia and Russia weight of Serbia and Russia, a little bit different categories. But they really believe that the states would uh, behave themselves like in the case of Balkans. And Russia would be kind of the second Serbia in Eurasia. As a result, miscalculations. But anyway, uh, concluding, I am not overestimating the results of the Rose Revolution. They become uh, one step in the chain of the developments. Let's see on Georgia now.
because uh, it was the first serious defeat of Saakashvili after the Rose Revolution, but uh, I'm not ready to bury him politically. Now he specially shares responsibility with uh, the Georgian dream. It could be a very paradoxical situation. In Georgia, there would be soon two parties of powers, two ruling parties and no opposition. Because one party would support the prime minister and the other one pr president. Now Saakashvili is a president. And he has uh, huge prerogatives according to the current constitution. It's necessary to survive presidential elections and introducing of constitutional reforms. Now it's not the end of the history. It's only the first step. And it would be uh, more complicated for Ivanishvili to say something uh, as uh, he was uh, opposition leader. Because you are not opponent of the power. You are part of the power. Very important part of the, this power, please. Be responsible. Uh, the question of recognition. Uh, first of all, we need to uh, find some stages in the Nagorno-Karabakh movement. Very different stages. Uh, since 1988 till 1991, September, uh, Armenia uh, tried to support the Nagorno-Karabakh movement and idea of Miatsu, unification of two Armenian entities. You know about the decree of the Supreme Soviet of uh, Armenia and uh, some other acts uh, supporting this idea. But uh, when Armenian leaders began understanding that USSR is a living corpse after events of August 1991, they uh, really uh, understood that this approach would be very problematic for international recognition of Armenia. This is why another approach uh, replaced previous one, self-determination of two different Armenian projects, Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia itself. And nowadays, Armenia is not ready to recognize Nagorno-Karabakh for very, very simple reasons. It's not Russia. It's not even Serbia. This is why uh, this reconsideration of status quo is uh, very problematic and could be used by the opponents of Armenia for the strengthening of its isolation. It's very, very simple, by the way. Maybe many Armenians, including officials, uh, could support Russian decision of 2008, taking into account controversial relationship between Armenia and Georgia. But Armenia now have only two open borders, Georgian and Iranian. Two of them are very vulnerable and problematic. And 75% of Armenian export and import goes through the Georgian border. No other questions, no other answers. And the uh, question of unfreezing of the conflicts. I think uh, that, uh, first of all, you are absolutely right. Now we are not, uh, we, we don't need to speak about uh, frozen conflicts. This uh, term, uh, relates to the uh, first half of the 90s because after the first wave of the conflicts where they were frozen, the status quo period was the dominant. But uh, yes, uh, the status quo free froze uh, the conflicts but uh, didn't secure the resolution and on the contrary provoked revenge uh, aspirations and, and, and so, so on. This is why since the end of 90s, different countries tried to reconsider the status quo. Ch Russia made it in Chechnya in 1999. Georgia tried it uh, in 1998 in Abkhazia, in Gali district. It was small war in Gali. And in October 2008 in Kadori Gorge. As for Azerbaijan, it was diplomatic pressure to exclude Nagorno-Karabakh from the negotiation process. Originally, Nagorno-Karabakh was engaged, as you know, and so on. But uh, 2004 events in South Ossetia were kind of watershed because it was the first time after Dagamis agreement ceasefire where bloodshed took place. I think events of 2004 are more important than events of 2008 
because the start was done in 2004, when and where Georgia firstly violated agreements on ceasefire. It was crucial mistake and miscalculation of Saakashvili. Promoting strong Georgia, Georgia, uh, prosperous Georgia, or paying pensions to uh, its citizens, Saakashvili could make more uh, successes. And Russia, by the way, was ready to this development scenario. I think uh, the crucial mistake of the West was done not in Georgia, not in uh, any Caucasus area, but in Transnistria in 2003. The uh, failure of so-called Kozak, Dmitry Kozak, or Dmitry Kazak plan, influenced on the hostility between the West and Russia more than Georgian Revolution. Georgian Revolution and other uh, events, uh, consequent events, were only consequence of this fact. In 2003, Vladimir Putin wanted to play a role of peacekeeper. He was really interested in unified Moldova, unified Georgia, and so on. But the West, being afraid of Russian dominance, imperialism, and so on, made a great mistake, promoting anti-Westernism and strengthening anti-Westernism sentiments in Russia. As for the prospects, uh, now we are witnesses of reshaping of new status quo. I told about uh, partially recognized entities, its new reality, not existing before 2008, uh, about more active engagement of uh, United States, European Union, uh, and the neighboring countries. But uh, I am not so pessimist because many interests uh, are crossing each other. For example, yes, Russia is a persistent military ally of Armenia. And uh, now uh, it agreed with the Yerevan on uh, exploitation of the base on the uh, much more profitable conditions in comparison with Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan, by the way. But on the other side, Russia shares the border with Azerbaijan, and uh, it became the first uh, neighbor of Azerbaijan, uh, demarked and delimited the border with this country. No Georgia, no Iran, no Armenia, of course. This is why this policy looks like the policy of scales, Russia is not ready to make final choice between Armenia and Azerbaijan. At the same time, the United States is not ready to make the same choice or choice between Georgia and Russia and so on. It, uh, or, uh, everything described by me uh, gives uh, chances to uh, maybe have more stable situation. But you know that many things in the Caucasus are determined not only by Kremlin, Gulistani Palace, or uh, Avlabar residential area in Tbilisi. Many things uh, could be provoked by a surgeon or privateer in the conflict zones and so. For officials and public figures, it's necessary to prevent uh, the scenario to be hostages of surgeon in the Caucasus. Okay, any other questions, comments, notes? Okay, uh, first of all, speaking about any conflicts, no matter Abkhazia, South Ossetia, or Kosovo, it's impossible to speak about solar responsibility. Uh, in my mind, uh, and this mind uh, is shared by uh, the Talevini report, by the way, <laughs> uh, Georgia is more responsible for uh, those uh, conflicts, especially for unfreezing of the conflict. Let's see on the conflict of uh, South Ossetia. Between 1992 and 2004, no any clash in the conflict zone, in the ceasefire zone. There was economic cooperation. Two sides uh, engaged in the conflict agreed on recognition of uh, car numbers of each other. They traveled and some assets worked in Georgia, some Georgians worked in South Ossetia, even some ethnic Georgians were represented in the de facto official structures of South Ossetia like Hachipuridze and some others. And Georgian language was recognized by, as, as official by the South Ossetian constitution. In 2004, 
abolished Ergnetti market and uh, violating uh, the Dagomis agreement, deploying uh, special troops of interior in the conflict zone, Georgia opened the way for answer, for, for response uh, from the Russian side. Of course, Russia prepared to this scenario. I am uh, really uh, not understanding the admirations in the West uh, about uh, recent Putin statements. He s said nothing. Russia, is, uh, Russia was trained, Russia uh, trained uh, its military, yes, <laughs> yes, of course. Because uh, Georgian Ossetian conflict is connected with Ossetian and Gush conflict, negative scenario, or Georgian military victory wasn't the interest of Russia, it's understandable. Misunderstandable for me is other thing. Russia is absolutely uh, failed to secure its position through many proofs, through dialogues, through non-governmental structures in the West and inside Russia. It uh, put very defensive position. We, 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 we are right and no matter. It was a very destructive position, by the way. Of course, uh, Russian uh, special services trained uh, South Ossetian colleagues and many of ethnic Russians were engaged, especially after 2004, in the uh, de facto authorities, of course. But uh, my Russian colleagues could uh, use uh, uh, another arguments like financial support of the uh, NATO and uh, U.S. for equipment and training of the Georgian troops. You know the program uh, Equip and Train launched in 2004 for Pankisi Gorge. United States gave money for preparation of anti-terrorist structures in Kadori Gorge for a special operation against Islamist Islamist group in the uh, Pankisi Gorge, not Kadori Gorge, Pankisi Gorge. Okay, but those guys were engaged in the unfreezing of conflicts in 2004. South Ossetia was recognized by Tbilisi, not by United States, by Russia, by Tbilisi as a site of the conflict, not like terrorist structure and so on. OECC recognized South Ossetia as a site of the conflict and subject of negotiations. But since 2004, Saakashvili persistently rejected any negotiations, originally decreased number of them, but in 2007 only one meeting in the framework of Joint Control Commission took place. Only one meeting. Instead of it, he proposed Dmitry Sanakoyev as so-called alternative Ossetian president. Okay, but uh, his uh, headquarters was located in the Georgian village, not South Ossetian. He had no support from the Ossetian side. And uh, he left South Ossetia due to uh, accusation in corruption in South Ossetia. He has not any troops. He was not uh, described as a side of the conflict due to uh, legislative uh, documents all documents exist in that times. This is why uh, sharing responsibility, I uh, see that Russia made some mistakes, first of all, formally judicially recognizing Abkhazia and South Ossetia, creating precedent, and uh, uh, violating the administrative or de facto state border between South Ossetia and uh, Georgia in August of 2008. Their response was not so adequate, in my mind. But originally, originally in 2004, the initiative was uh, on the Georgian side. But it's, it's, it's my personal opinion. Uh, 2008, 2008, yes. It was done after 2006 event. In 2006, introducing the uh, troops of the Minister of Interior, Georgia violated Moscow agreement after Dagomis agreement. Yes, Russia then was engaged in this violation. You are absolutely right. Deploying the railway uh, forces, they were not uh, peacekeepers. They were not described in the uh, Moscow agreement mentioned. 
Russia also uh, joined the uh, violation of status quo. Yes, of course. And I, I mentioned this fact uh, m many times. Yes? The, the, the same situation deals with uh, equipment supplies to de facto states. But all those steps were done as a response. Maybe response was not adequate, but the ground for response was. By the way, a couple of years ago, many observers quoted WikiLeaks cables. First of all, reports or cables of Taft, Ambassador Taft. But, uh, sorry, Taft, describing the situation of the 8th of uh, August, didn't mention about the Russian presence, military presence, or military provocations in South Ossetia. He uh, describes only maybe South Ossetian provocations in the absence of empirical data proving the Russian engagement. He describes in detailed way this. We heard something from the Georgian friends, but we have no proofs of it. Maybe some uh, kinds of uh, South Ossetian engagement. And last, no least uh, point. Okay, uh, let's agree, I'm ready to agree, that Russian uh, engagement was uh, very important, uh, maybe crucially important for those conflicts. Uh, but uh, anyway, it doesn't mean that people of Abkhaz and Ossetian background or the territories are ready to be integrated to Georgia. They are more radical, by the way, the Russians, that Russians. And the Russian position to South Ossetia and Abkhazia was not permanent. Don't forget that Russia in 1996 joined Georgia organizing blockade of Abkhazia. I, I remember the situation when all men since 18 till 60 were prohibited to cross the Pso River border. And that time, nobody said about violation of democracy, human rights, and, and, and so on. But it was. All Abkhaz men between 1860 were prohibited to cross the border. And Russian border keepers shot, by the way, for some attempts to cross it. The idea to internationalize negotiation belonged to Vladislav Arzimba, president of Abkhazia, not to the Georgian leaders. Uh, do you know what personality is uh, the most hatred in Abkhazia? Evgeny Primakov, Russian Minister of the Foreign Affairs, who promoted the project of a common state between Abkhazia and Georgia, who forced Vladislav Arzimba, President of Abkhazia, to travel to Tbilisi to sign document on the common state and, and, and so on and so on. Russia blamed both Abkhazia and South Ossetia for a referenda of 90s. And there were official statements on this. By the way, uh, North Ossetia recognized independence of South Ossetia in 1992. But when Putin came to power, uh, you know that he corrected the le regional legislation of Russian constituencies. And this point was excluded from the legislation of North Ossetia in 2000. This is why this position was not so simple. And as for comparison between Saakashvili and Putin, uh, some nuances are, of course, we uh, don't see, have not seen, maybe, uh, such procedures as recently took place in Georgia, in the Russian case. But uh, believe me, if Saakashvili had mineral resources or uh, nuclear weapons, I'm not sure. He personally would be more Democrat than Putin. Don't forget about the interference of the United States. I uh, not uh, accidentally uh, uh, mentioned the advertising paper and the Oval Cabinet meeting between Obama and Saakashvili. And uh, I personally was engaged in some consultancy with the American diplomats. I know this process. Saakashvili was very extensively pressed from the American side to follow the democratic procedures and so on. And the process of transit now is not completed, by the way. The first step was done, yes. Now the Georgia uh, has a new uh, speaker of the parliament. Yes, Davido Supashvili is a new speaker. 
I think uh, in a couple of days, uh, Bedzina Ivanishvili would be uh, the prime minister. It would be the first case of coexistence of prime minister and uh, president belonging to different political camps. But it's necessary to survive presidential elections. And constitutional reforms uh, introducing. Don't forget that Saakashvili launched uh, his uh, constitutional reforms not uh, sake for democracy, but to keep his political presence after the second term. Georgia is not Azerbaijan. Here, the third term is not working. This is why, uh, as a prime minister or leader of the ruling party, maybe, but till now it is. He has huge prerogatives. He controls special services. He controls uh, state chancellery. It's a very huge uh, segment of the power. Ivanishvili doesn't privatize all segments of it. But uh, for me personally, as for a realist, uh, practical things are more important. Let's see on the situation around the third term of Ilham Aliyev. No real comment, some violations in the course of parliamentary elections and, and so on. Georgia would be criticized for not half quarter of such violations, but non, or, or Armenia, for example. In the case of Armenia, these violations would be uh, immediately connected with pro-Russian orientation of Yerevan and so on. In the case of Azerbaijan, no. Some cases or also, uh, United States uh, miss many responses from the Azerbaijani side. What's about uh, Mr. Mekhtiev comments? We are independent country. Don't advise us. It was comment of uh, head of presidential administration after Safarov's case. Azerbaijan is an independent country. Okay, we are friends, but... No, 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 not for the for this uh, ground. This is why. But thank you for your comment. Really, thank you. The World Beyond the Headlines Lecture Series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from the Norman Waite Harris Memorial Fund. Download recordings of other events and learn more about the World Beyond the Headlines series at the Center for International Studies website, cis.uchicago.edu.